joining in. We're just about to start a really exciting discussion on how do we get better at engaging men in the conversation on gender. Um, I wanted to introduce you all to my colleague, Diane Lee, who is going to be the moderator for this panel. She is my colleague at Delbrook. Um, she leads a lot of our gender work alongside me. She was your MC for the gender track yesterday, if you were on yesterday's session. And she's currently exploring how to engage men and boys in Bihar on family planning and nutrition. She's extremely passionate about the topic. So Diane, thank you um, and off to you. Super, thanks so much, Lata. Um, I wanted to kick this off with a short story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was doing some research in Chhattisgarh with my Dahlberg team. And our mandate was actually to design an app for providing maternal and child health information to rural women. Um, we were doing all these prototyping sessions largely with pregnant women and young mothers. And I just remember one of the first things we heard very loud and clear from these women was why are you only talking to us, right? Can you make this thing useful for our husbands also? Because we want them to know this information as well. And that was such an aha moment for me and an incredibly humbling experience. We really had not planned to engage men in these discussions much, assuming that this information would be most useful for the women and that the return on investment was gonna be higher if we targeted women for this type of information. But recent research has really shown that this kind of low hanging fruit mentality has really led the development community to only exacerbate centuries old gender norms in patriarchy. Um, such as women's role as caregivers and men's role as breadwinners. So in that research, we went back and of course, talked to a lot of different men and also came up with ways to engage them better. But largely efforts to improve the lives of women and girls around the world and in India and to promote gender equality has been about providing more resources and opportunities to women and girls, um, about building their confidence, helping them stand up and advocate for themselves. But if men are such a big part of the problem, why aren't they more a part of the solution? And so in this session, we're gonna be exploring the missing half. How do we bring in men and boys into the gender conversation? And we're gonna start the conversation by exploring really the why. Uh, why is this all worth it? But hoping to really dig in with our experts here on the how. How do we really engage men and boys and how not to? especially in this new COVID world as uh, things have really turned upside down. Um, and I'm so excited to have this discussion with our five panelists here today who are really some of the leading voices in this space. And I'm just gonna be apologetic right here and, and tell you that uh, I'm not gonna do, do justice to the introductions because I have limited time, but here I go. Um, we have Devyani Srinivasan, a researcher at Nilekani Philanthropies which is really one of the leading funders in the gender space in India that have been advocating for uh, bringing men and boys at, to the center of uh, promoting gender equality. And we have Gary Bar Barker joining from uh, Promundo. He's the founder and CEO. Promundo has worked across more than 40 countries over uh, decades to engage men and boys in advancing gender equality and promoting positive masculinities. We also have with us Harish Sadani, um, who is the co-founder of MAVA, Men Against Violence and Abuse, which is one of India's first men-based organizations on preventing violence against women. Um, we're really excited to have also Ravi Verma, who is the South Asia Regional Director at ICRW, where he has done a significant amount of work to understand violence from gender and masculinity perspectives um, and they've designed some of the most effective interventions uh, involving school and sports-based programs. Not uh, last but not least, we also have Sujata Kandekar joining um, from Koro. She's the founder and executive director. Koro supports leaders in the most marginalized communities and help them create social change in their own uh, communities. And as part of this work, Coro has been working tirelessly and extensively to engage men and boys to promote gender equality and empower women and uh, girls as well. So we're going to start this discussion uh, in the first half an hour or so with myself moderating, but then we would love to turn it over to some audience Q&A towards the end. So uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom uh, panel 
to send across any questions you may have for our panelists throughout the discussion, and we'll be sure to get to some of those. Um, before we begin, I actually wanted to run a very quick poll with the audience to better understand who all is in this Zoom room today, but also uh, perhaps just as importantly, who all are not. Uh, so the tech team, can we pull up the audience poll, please? So we have three questions for you, pretty simple. Number one, which gender do you identify with? Number two, on a scale of pain to gain, what has been your experience in engaging men and boys in the gender conversation? And number three, what is your professional background? All right, hope you all had a chance to answer that question. Can we show our panelists the results, please? Are they still trickling in? Okay, sorry, I'm hearing that it's still trickling in from our nearly 200 uh, audience who's on this line. Let's give it another 10, 20 seconds. Okay, here we go. Um, hope you can all see the poll results. So of the nearly 200 people in this room, we have 85% who identify as female, 13% as male, 1% as gender variant, gender non-conforming. Um, on the question of pain versus gain, the predominant answer was moderate pain. Panelists, please note, <laughs> um, followed by neutral and high pain. So only about 20% thought there was more to gain actually. And uh, about half of us are from the NGO sector. Um, and a third of us are from the research and consulting world. Uh, and we have very few uh, from the policymaker and donor community. And so uh, this has actually not been the worst gender imbalance from uh, one of these sessions. Um, I don't know what my panelists think, but I've definitely been in rooms where it was just entirely women talking to one another. But I think this just underscores the heart of the problem here, right? When we talk about gender equality, um, where it is so important to involve men in the discussion, why are men absent? And what can we do about it um, to flip this dynamic is really at the core of our discussion today. And we're keen to explore also the role of COVID um, in, in all of this. And so I wanted to actually start with a question for each of the panelists um, to ask each of you, as our audience said, there's a lot of pain, perhaps unclear gains, right? When we're trying to engage men and boys. Can you describe for us the moment when you or your organization decided that you needed to actually engage men and boys in promoting gender inequality? gender equality. Why did you decide that engaging men was more gain than pain? Um, and I'll just actually start um, with Harish, who is going to be at the left hand of the of panel and then just go through the rest. Go for it. Hi. Harish. Yeah. Hi. So I had, you know, several factors in my growing up years, my own paternal aunts, who actually put a fine imprint on me, on my character. You know, at a younger age, when I was doing household chores and I was labeled as sissy or girlish, I remember I never used to take those taunts personally, but rather reflect that why am I called like a girl? Is the role of girl undervalued? 
you know so you know at a very younger age i was closely observing uh, how women were treated at homes you know violence within homes because i was staying in a community dwelling where i could see neighbors lives with close proximity then as i was growing up you know i was writing letters to a film star you know who's now no more smita patil i used to have a exchange writing letters where i used to write to her how i used to view her films from a gender lens and what were the gaps which i felt the gap which included absence of men in this whole moment of addressing violence and as i was doing my masters in social work at tata institute of social sciences you know i used to realize that when i was volunteering with a women's group and observing how they were responding to counseling and other factors i realized that you know men were completely out of the conversation even post violence before violence or you know any kind of discrimination on women so i felt that was a big gap and you know the history is that there was a journalist who had given at the same time an appeal in a newspaper calling for men and you know 205 men wrote this was in 1991 and i was the one who had responded among those 205 and i took the mantle and that's how this organization men against violence and abuse was born so it's a combination of different factors which enabled me to you know take the lead thanks sir for sharing your personal story gary would love to hear from you yeah i am um... I'm from the US originally and moved to Brazil in the early 90s to coordinate a study with UNICEF on girls who were being sexually exploited. And working with um government social workers and some nights we went out with police, we were interviewing girls in the situation and I kept asking the question, why aren't we talking to the men at the bar? Uh we can go every night with police and arrest the men. and there's more the next night there's men who are paying for sex and there's men who aren't paying for sex but are sitting next to their buddies watching them knowing that they're paying for sex with underage girls and i remember how tough it was with my colleagues to say i think we're sitting at the wrong side of the table here if we actually want to stop this flow we don't have enough prison space to keep arresting these men we've got to look at what is it that's driving what is it that allows them to do this and why are so many of their buddies watching it but not saying anything so i think you know kind of as you described your aha moment and the other thing is that as a uh, native english speaker learning other languages it's fantastic to watch how learning another language helps you deconstruct your own and i guess listening to the gendered language that we talk about empowering women i kept thinking how in brazilian portuguese the expression of violence against women and sexual exploitation of girls sounded like it was missing words and i realized in english it does as well because violence against women is men's violence against women <laughs> the sexual exploitation of girls is men's sexual exploitation of girls in large part we forget that there's an there's an object uh, or a subject in that sentence and that allows us to think that somehow or and the same applies to everything in gender the unpaid care burden on women is not because venusians or martians have abandoned women to do the care work it is men not doing our share so i think you know for for us i founded by kind of instigating that conversation with some amazing brazilian colleagues we founded promundo a few years later with the fairly simple idea that gender equality needs men and men need gender equality and i think that last part we often forget so that's been an inspiration for us as well to say men need to be part of this not as a favor not as champions not as afterthoughts we're in it whether we're resisting it <laughs> whether we're silent on the side or whether we're for it but there's no way to ignore that the world gets better for all of us and promundo's name mean is is basically a contraction of for the world in portuguese with the notion to try to get beyond the notion that gender equality is done to men um kicking and screaming <laughs> and instead to say we need men part of the equation you have no choice it'll get better if you want to be part of it but there's no choice but to engage men in the process 
Thanks, Gary. And we will be exploring um, what is it in for men? So I want to definitely put a pin on that idea that men need to do this uh, for themselves as well. And want to now hear from Sujata, over to you. The strategy of working with men, uh, precisely from the very feminist perspective with which we were working on uh, violence against women in low-income communities of Mumbai. So we, and we were doing everything that was to be done around violence against women, like counseling, training, creating awareness, legal aid, et cetera, et cetera. But then there was, we realized that there was something missing in that whole thing. The work that we were doing was like uh, fetching water in the sea. Like you keep doing that unendingly, untiringly, but then there was no reduction in the violence as such. There were few realizations while, uh, were, and we were completely focused on women when we're dealing with domestic violence and even violence in the public domain. So there were few realizations in the process that it was not enough to work with women alone because more, quite often we found that uh, the violence on women got increased when they started speaking for themselves as a backlash because men felt threatened. I mean, the woman who was not talking, who was not demanding or asking anything, if she uh, breaks her silence and says she's getting violated, then the backlash, in terms of backlash, the violence was increased. So there was something missing in that. How do we combat this backlash? That was one thing. And also the realization was, uh, it is not enough to work only with the patterns and instances of violence, because there were so many cases. Every day we used to get flooded with the cases of violence against women. So we learned, we realized that it is important to work with not the patterns and instances, but to the with work with the mental models that are creating, perpetuating, endorsing, justifying violence. And in that ambit, actually, you see, how do we change social norms? How do we challenge and change social norms that uh, perpetuate and endorse and justify violence against women? So the role of men becomes very crucial because they have to be brought in communication. They are, yes, they are part of problem, but they are also part of solution. So they must be brought on the table as partners and not merely as perpetrators. That was realization. Uh, which happened during the process. And that's how uh, we arrived at the strategy to work with men as, as an organization. Great, thanks, Sujata. Um, I'd love to turn it over now to Devyani, either in your personal experience or for uh, as a pillar of strategy for Nilakani Philanthropies. When did you realize that you need to engage men? Yeah, so I think for Nilekini Philanthropies, our work with our portfolio of organizations um, that engage young men and boys on gender equality is really driven by Rohini's belief that, you know, programs that work on women's empowerment are never really going to achieve their full potential unless we also work with men, right? So that's kind of part one. But I think part two is very much that those programs also need to address men's fears and men's needs, right, uh, for them to really be sustainable. And so that's kind of the philosophy with which um, we kind of decide to, you know, which organizations are going to be part of the portfolio. Um, I think we're learning from the organizations all the time. So even within our portfolio, there are, I would say, about three different approaches in terms of how the organization is thinking about benefits to men. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that later as we go into the discussion. I think for me personally, um, you know, obviously with Me Too and with the Nirbhaya case, we've had a lot of moments where we've really brought attention to kind of violence and inequality against women. But what's kind of bothered me is that those incidents have also been quite polarizing, right? Um, and I think unless we start to see men as part of the solution and not only part of the problem, um, we are actually going to see increasing violence and polarization in society. Thanks, Devyani. We are going to be <coughs> three approaches, uh, but for now, we'll turn it over to Ravi. Well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, ICRW was one of the uh, first premier research 
women's research organization that uh, recognized uh, while working on the issues of domestic violence, the significance of working with men. 2001, 2002, ICRW did a major uh, national survey in India, which really threw up some very interesting results. And uh, that shook the foundation of the idea of gender itself, because a lot of women were also justifying violence that was happening within the within the households. And that study did show that um, uh, how men condone violences and even women become party to the larger patriarchal structure uh, that seems to go beyond men and women. So, so it became very obvious to us that we need to think not in binaries of men and women when engaging men in, in this whole discourse, but we, we need to reframe the discourse on gender that <clears throat> bring men and women and all other gender variants onto a continuum of, of, uh, of spectrum and to begin to uh, question where does all this come from? And I think uh, that was a time, 2001-2, when within the HIV sector, men were being, I, I'm using the word deliberately, men were being used as instrumental, uh, from a very instrumental lens to reduce the infection and, and um, you know, uh, and reduce the uh, HIV infection rate. And that is a time we, uh, we began to bring in the whole idea of gender transformation in, in the discourse on women's empowerment and men's engagement. I think, uh, so we come from, the, uh, from that perspective that the, the whole, uh, the entire uh, discourse and, and discussions around engaging men has to have uh, an element of questioning the construct of gender. It doesn't have to be equated only with women and it has to uh, uh, have uh, the idea of uh, how do we address the structures and institutions and larger norms that seem to sustain a particular gender relations and regime which impacts both women and men and others uh, in, a, in a particular order. And, uh, and, and, and we should really work at many different levels to, um, to enable questioning that kind of a, uh, that kind of a um, structural, uh, you know, those structural parameters that make men, women and everyone to, to fall in line with that kind of expectations. So, and, and, and it has been a personal journey also doing that, doing this has never been an easy uh, task because uh, people, uh, nobody wants to give up powers. Nobody wants to uh, be questioned beyond a comfortable level. So uh, uh, talking about gender means uh, raising the levels of discomfort. And, and that discomfort is not only for others, for, for me as well as a man, and as a person who is living in families and with peers, with other friends and in an institutional setting where you have to constantly prove yourself that you are, you are truly engaged in a discussion which impacts you as well. So, so, it's, it's, a, so it's, a, it's a journey for me, uh, this whole issue of working on gender and both personal and collective in terms of understanding what, uh, what it means to engaging men, engaging myself into this discussion and all my other colleagues. Thank you. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah, it really sounds like for all of our panelists, it's been uh, a learning and a, and a journey. And you're all such believers um, in the importance of doing this work. But clearly, our audience thought there was a lot of pain um, in the difficulty of doing exactly what Ravi, you just mentioned, right? Getting people to give up power in some sense. And so I wanted to ask you guys, um, what are the biggest challenges or areas of pushback or perhaps unintended consequences, some of those difficulties, the pains that come with engaging men and boys? Um, and I wanted to start with the sort of on-ground perspective uh, from mobilizing communities in India. So perhaps we can start with Sujata and then I'll... Yeah. Yeah. yeah, actually, see, en engaging men, uh, uh, well, engaging men is a difficult task. I mean, difficult in the sense it's a long-term task. It's a, it's a process. It's not a quick fix thing. Uh, the solution is not quick fix. So you have to engage uh, with patience, process, and participation for a longer time. That itself becomes 
uh, an impediment. Like how do you engage men? Because they have different priorities, especially if you see young men, actually their priorities were different kind of, uh, their distractions were different. So holding them together for a long time until, because the change doesn't happen, the, May, may not be transformation, but even the commencement of change wouldn't happen so easily because we have to unlearn everything that we have learned in our upbringing. And this is both true for men and women, as Ravi would just say. I mean, even women in those some kind of masculinities and femininities. So the problem becomes even more complex in that sense. So keeping people together in the process was always a challenge for uh, when we were working in bits and pieces, you know, kind of, because we did um, uh, research on masculinities, construction of masculinities. And as a follow up that we started working with almost 1,500 young men in the community, but we couldn't sustain because beyond the, their anxieties and um, curiosities around sexuality, actually they had also different needs like education, employment, livelihood, et cetera, which we couldn't cater to at that point of time. And which we are now trying to actually correct it in the process after this learning. So those have been kind of challenges to keep them together, uh, to even, I mean, uh, giving away your power, you know, kind of thing. All the privileges that you enjoy because of just being a man kind of thing. So letting that go, because that takes a lot of negotiation. And unless you are very uh, closely interacting with people for a longer time, this change doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, and what about you, Harish, especially in your work uh, with um, men communities? Yeah, so I have been working largely with uh, young men and adolescent boys, you know, for a longer period, more than a decade, you know, like 13 years ago, I started an initiative, you know, with some 33 men. And later on, it got upscaled in 10 other districts of my state. And now, you know, I'm trying to replicate in other regions of India. So, you know, with the young men, say, you know, who are in their 20s and 30s, you find that, uh, you know, uh, working with them, you know, uh, you need a lot of perseverance. You need, uh, you know, uh, ways in which you can make uh, conversations with them, interesting conversations where there is a safe space, where they can open up, where they will not be judged or labeled, you know, where they can talk about their vulnerabilities and anxieties equally. And I think that is the crux part, you know, that when you see the one side of, you know, the man wearing on his head, uh, you know, a crown which is full of thorns on one side that he's powerful, but the other side when you see the vulnerable side and you give a space for men to open up and, you know, talk freely, you know, conversations which uh, up till now have been tabooed, you know, when you talk about man-woman relationships, you need to talk about sexuality. So, you know, in today's time, I think raising a boy is all the more difficult and challenging than it was some 15 years ago. You know, the age of, um, you know, uh, adolescence or puberty is declining as young as 11 year old boy comes of age. And you find that even in case of girls, if she gets information about menstruation from another woman from her family or any close person and even though some feminists might contest that there is no dialogue but the key part is at least there is some conversation which nobody can contest at least there is some conversation but when it comes to boys a growing up boy nobody talks to him about you know um what happens to the body, what happens, you know, to the physical changes, psychological changes as he grows up, to whom does he ask about erections, issues related to erections and the like. So I find that if you give space where, you know, and, and it's not a surprise that 95% of young men, growing up men, have 
one of their primary sources of information on sexuality as pornography you know so whether they admit it or not you know and even if they are from well to do schools and even if schools impart there, there are enough examples where teachers of biology try to skip the chapter on human reproduction and ask the students to learn it by themselves so you know you find that as the age of puberty is lessening and there are lots of simmering things you know boys as they are growing up they are in suffocating molds you know nobody talks to them they have something simmering you know the testosterone levels as they are younger is at the higher level and at that moment if they are not guided and if they resort to any kind of violence or you know offensive behavior it is easier to label them that they are criminals but you have never given them an alternative you have never give, you have never responded to the unmet needs of countless of young growing up boys in our country so i think there are a lot of gaps and you know when you try to you know even if for example i when i address uh, when i'm mentoring a group of young men within a classroom or within a particular space i know that the moment after my interaction is over they are back to the world where you know patriarchy is very much there so you know like and and in another uh, another vexing problem in today's time is that there are multiple inequalities working simultaneously so which was in the situation you know 20 30 years as much you know as it is now so you know you you have in india now we are talking about covid virus but there are two viruses apart from covid which we all have to deal you know so one is the communal virus and the other is this patriarchal virus so i think you know so these viruses have been existing for many years and if they have been reinforced by institutions like religion for example you know which in hinduism for example if it is 5000 years old so that means 5000 years old beliefs about how men should be in control controlling women you know if they have been professed and if they have been reinforced over the years so it's it's not going to die easily you know so even if you engage with one target group there will be constant tussles of the man with whom you are engaging you know he should be able to fight the matches more he's he should be able to fight with the man within within him and simultaneously use reasoning to you know guide him where he wants to go so i think you know it's a big uh, you know there are several hiccups you know and one challenge you know i'm taking a little time you know in today's time one of the things i Looks like um, we lost Harish at a critical moment, um, but just in the interest of time, I uh, heard a lot of the challenges. Right, it is a long-term game; it's not a quick fix. Um, it takes a lot of perseverance, um, even if you work with the men and boys in a contained environment. There are so many societal forces throughout the life and the communities and so forth. Um, that are really outside of your control. The social norms, the patriarchal norms <clears throat> that for centuries, really. And so I wanted to now shift gears a little bit to talk about solutions. Um, Lani, you mentioned that you've seen three different approaches that have worked well in uh, combating some of these challenges. So I wanted to turn it over to you to talk a little bit about what you've seen um, from the Nilakani philanthropy's perspective in this space. So, yeah, so I mean, I think what we've seen are kind of three different approaches to thinking about benefits for men, right? Because I think that's one of the key questions here is what would boys and men consider benefits for themselves from engaging in this work, right? um and so while it might be too early to say this is successful or this is not you know i'm happy to kind of share what we've seen um so one is the approach that looks at trying to get boys and men to be active in kind of activism in a way on gender equality and gender awareness right so for them to take active roles in spreading the message in generating awareness 
And kind of the theory of change behind that approach is that men and boys gain sort of skills that are transferable, right? So they gain communication skills, they gain critical thinking, problem solving, but in the process are also uh, sensitized to gender issues and you know kind of move towards gender equality. So that's really the first approach. The second ap approach kind of takes the perspective that gender norms and gender identities are you know damaging for men as well as women. Um, I don't know about equally, but they are kind of damaging or at least restricting for boys and men. And the ability to kind of challenge those norms, embrace other identities, other masculinity. <laughs> is really the benefit for men and boys from engaging in these approaches, right? The third approach, which is kind of um, the approach of some of the organizations that are new to our portfolio, but is quite interesting, is kind of the intersectional approach, right? Which is not saying that men and boys are equally, let's say, uh, restricted by social norms and gender identities as women, but men in different contexts, right? So men of lower caste or men of, you know, or we see this a lot with boys, right? So boys may exert power over girls of their age, but very frequently they are also in situations where, you know, they may have an abusive parent or they may be older boys bullying them, right? So the third approach is kind of using intersectionality to really, I think, um, build empathy among boys and men to kind of help them relate to situations where they've been sort of dominated or oppressed or violated and to link that to women's experience. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Devyani. Sure. Um, wanted to pick up on the first point you made, which is the importance of articulating the benefit for men and boys. And it's a really nice argument that, you know, this is really, there's no zero sum game. Right? There are you know, losers potentially, men are going to gain as much of, uh, as if, if not more than women in this journey. Um, circling back to Ravi's point around giving up power though, is it always a win-win situation? When is it not? And if it's not, how do we articulate or create those benefits for men and boys? I wanted to turn it over to Ravi, you know. Um, you like these strict, sticky questions. So I wanted to challenge you with this one. Oh. Oh. Oh, I thought you were asking Devyani the same follow up question. Well, oh, this was for me, right? I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, this is good. <laughs> no, because I think we have learned. Um, over the long years of working with men and boys in different age groups, in different communities, a couple of things that we have learned. Um, some, of, some of the things that Devyani said, I endorse completely on, on, because those are the larger framework theory of change. But, um, uh, but I definitely want to emphasize that uh, we, if we want to engage at, at, at men and boys and, and address this whole issue of <laughs> raising the ability to question power and entitlement, then it has to begin very early in life. So we have one of the, uh, one of the approaches that we clearly advocate for and work passionately within ICRW and partners is to engage at a very young age from 10, 11, 12 to 14, 16. And that, that's, that particular spectrum of age itself provides a, a long journey for these boys and girls to go through uh, is where they begin to question and then they shrink back and they again come out and so it's a kind of oscillating situation that we see in that age but then it, that's the age when they are uh, they are uh, able to question and they ask questions innocently and many of them take and when I am using the word innocently means they have there are no baggages at that time and they're building those baggages and I think that is a time when we need to uh, uh, to make sure that we saturate the interventions uh, at that age uh, of so I'll start early. Two, we definitely think that these interventions need to be situated within the institutions because a lot of a lot of uh, what boys and girls begin to grow to learn and imbibe or internalize are um, and others have alluded to these points indirectly, but I am just explicit. 
I'm ex making it explicit is uh, that th those ideas are sustained, nurtured by the institutions within which they uh, study, where they play, or where they go to interact with their peers. So there are many uh, institutions within which the boys are made out, made to believe in certain ways of, uh, you know, uh, of, of enjoying the entitlement or making that as, a, as their safe space. So I think if you want to penetrate into the idea of men's and boys safe spaces where they preserve those ideas of, of being masculine and proving themselves and aggressiveness, then we need to work within those structured uh, institutional spaces where you find these places to to get in. This is the second very important. I think this is a very uh, this needs to be uh, needs to be worked out in operational details. But conceptually, we need to be very clear that we are going to address those safe spaces, whether it is offline, online, in terms of the internet users, or is it their friend circles, sports groups, you know, other kinds of things within the institutional framework. And third piece that I we think and our colleagues and I we have been working relentlessly is to uh, find ways to uh, bring some kind of a convergence because I think if you are if you have ecological kind of understanding of these issues which is not possible for every intervention to really reach but there there has to be some way to connect these institutional programs with community-based programs and and that means there has to be uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, you know, change, if I don't want to use the word change agents, but someone who would anchor these change process on a sustained basis. So within the schools, for example, and the institutions, we really think that uh, we need to uh, work with teachers or the mentors in such in some ways that they remain there and they continue to engage in these difficult conversations for time to come. It's not a project specific uh, piece of work that they are doing, but it is some kind of transformation that they themselves are going through. They have to change their pedagogy. They need to change the learning and teaching styles in a way which will be engaging and, uh, and, and uh, inclusive and participatory and be ready to face difficult questions from the children without being perturbed or without being dismantled about their self-image of as a teacher who is very powerful, you know? So uh, if we work with these kind of three principles, it is, I think, uh, is something that uh, would perhaps sow the seed of raising and challenging some of those difficult uh, uh, you know, uh, issues that men take for granted, the boys take for granted, and they don't even, they don't even see that is happening around them. So I think, and, and this experiment I tell you was so interesting uh, in one of the sports program where we invented these teachable moments. So wherever, the boys and men engage into a conversation which is sexist and they just do it by way of a normalized process, there has to be someone who immediately points it out. You know, it's a bystander or teachable moments kind of uh, interventions are so powerful because they really put people on a spot like you put me on a spot. That's what is uh, important for men to take a step back and then reflect and then see what they do next. Mm. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Ravi. Yeah, so I think both from Devyani and Ravi, we got a lot of suggestions from engaging boys as early as possible to providing institutional, sustained, nurtured support to creating teachable moments, um, using intersectionality to really build empathy on uh, some of the moments that boys and men are also more vulnerable in. Um, wanted to uh, quickly turn it over to Gary before we move on to audience Q&A to see if he has anything else to add. Um, from Mundo, you know, from your beginnings at Brazil, but really has been expanding its work globally and you've worked in over 40 different countries. Are there any tips and tricks uh, that you might want to share? I think I'll, I'll pick up on some of the points that, that Ravi brought up and it's a pleasure to be on the panel with Ravi and Harish and Sujata. We've I've had a chance to, to learn together and learn from over many years. So thrilled to get to exchange again. I think one of the approaches that we've been doing increasingly is to, and I'm picking up on some of Ravi's metaphors around, you know, I think for many, for, for much of our work is trying to almost as if men are fish in a fishbowl, 
who don't perceive the water around them. You know, if you ask a fish, how's the water? A fish is likely to say, what water? It is, we're so enmeshed in these norms. They're so normal to us that um, what our group education tries to do is to get men to be aware of that. Most of us come out of popular education approaches that are to try to bring awareness of how gender inequality, patriarchy, other power dynamics work. That only goes so far. We can only get so many fish at a time. And it you know, becomes the big question of what happens when men step out of those groups and they go back to their relationships, to home, to workplace, to the world that says, we're fine with this unequal status quo. So I think increasingly we're going from, you know, yes, that kind of awareness raising, Paulo Freirean type consciousness raising education works, but it's very slow and often unsustainable. If we really want to achieve the change that we're after for this, we've got to think about changing the systems. And so I think it's about, you know, we spent a lot of time measuring norms and looking at men's norms about gender equality. We're looking increasingly to say, let's change the whole structure around them. So what does that look like? We worked with Brazil's Ministry of Health to create a men's prenatal health protocol. So it's not that we work in group education to convince men they should be part of a prenatal visit and supporting the child to come, but to say, let's change the system. When he comes in, assuming he's not using violence, assuming the female partner wants him there, she's the center of the attention. But we shifted to say, let's make that system inviting to him. There's a chair for him to sit during the consultation. Someone comes during the consultation and says, we've got Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday at this time next week for you to come back for your appointment because you need your own session to talk about family planning, to do STI tests and all the rest. Making the system create a space for him that says we expect nothing less than you're part of this. And we use that as, as Robbie said, a teachable moment. Conditional cash transfers or microcredit programs around the world focused on women. We continue to send a message that we don't think men are really very responsible at the household level. We consider them kind of by the design of those programs, we consider them um, antagonistic to the goals of it. What if we flip them around? We're doing that in, in the case of Colombia, working with their national cash transfer program to say, we create expectations that men are part of the process, not shifting the control of the funds to her, but saying we add either a small conditionality or a small piece of the program that says, we want you men here to support your female partner to enter the paid workforce or to do part of the care work. Uh, or build it into schools, as Ravi was talking about. Build it into workplaces rather than thinking sort of one man at a time. And the other part I think we need to say is we can't do this work as if let's get men over here on their own. Sometimes it's quite useful. Sometimes it's a great starting point. But it's got to be in relational perspective with women. Men need to be, we need to be held accountable by women. We need to be in debate and discussion, whether in the workplace or school or the health sector, where there's, there's an, a back and forth questioning as the change processes happen. So I think the other is to not get stuck in um, that this is men only stuff. This is toward the cause of gender equality. It needs to be done in that relational perspective. And the other point I'll bring up is that it's often easy to say, well, look, no men wanna participate here. There's no low hanging fruit when it comes to engaging men here. I think everywhere we've looked, even some of the most conservative settings, if we're able to create that safe space, there is at least a third of men, a quarter of men, sometimes half of men who are already on our side, but we've not been brave enough or creative enough to find the ways to engage them, to change the rules and say, we know that you can be called into this. And so part of this is to accept that deep discomfort that we have to say, yes, we need you part of this, but this is not just you being a champion who comes in and says, oh, I'm going to be the good guy and now fix things. This is really messy stuff, but you have to be brave enough and we're going to make the space where you must be part of this conversation and you can't walk away from it. <laughs> so I think what we're, you know, in, in some to say, how do we go from those individual processes that we do find gains for men, but we make a world that says there's no choice. Gender equality is an end that we don't give you a choice to being part of. <laughs> you'll find some gain, you'll find some pain, but we don't give you a choice we as the humanity have said we need this. And like anything that we believe is good for public health, is required for justice, we're not giving you a choice. Um, and I think it's that systemic approach 
um, that we've got to be brave enough to think that big um, mm -hmm. that I would urge us to, to move toward. Thanks, Gary. Just building on that point of taking a systemic approach and really building change into the world that men and boys live in, right? Part of change the fishbowl. Um, COVID has clearly thrown this world upside down in so many ways, right? Uh, and in this conference throughout, we've talked a lot about the different risks that it creates, but also using this crisis as a moment of opportunity. So I just wanted to throw out an open question um, to anybody who wants to take take this, to ask what potentially entry points have COVID also created in better engaging men and boys? Sujata, do you have a response? We can't hear you. Can someone unmute? Uh -huh, okay. So, yeah, I think um, two things that uh, the COVID pandemic has thrown out, you know, uh, in terms of human dynamics. One is the vulnerabilities of all people have become so evident, you know, and there is feeling that we are all sailing in the same boat kind of thing. So that, and because I'm, I'm saying this because generally we feel that men feel very powerful uh, and that's how is the basis of violence, etc. But then when we did some interviews with men in this uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic, actually men also broke down on the phone. The first reaction, uh, the response was, you are the first to ask me how I'm feeling, you know, or, or how I, I am. And then the baggage of being a breadwinner has literally shattered because these people have lost their livelihoods. There are so many uncertainties. They don't know whether they'll get any payment or any money there. So actually they have become so vulnerable. So actually that position I thought was, uh, that could be a starting point for starting different kind of conversations. You know, when vul vulnerability of everybody is evident. And second, there is also some kind of realization of mutuality and interdependability. Sometimes in selfish way, but sometimes yes. I mean, for example, I care for your safety because I care for my safety. That kind of interdependence of mutuality, that feeling also we see. So I was thinking if we could actually uh, use this as leverages to start completely different kind of communication with men and women also, I mean, because they both endorse uh, each other's uh, structural notions, etc. So actually, the, I thought this was leverage uh, for this. And uh, one, actually, I also thought that there is a risk that this pandemic has also created, because the pandemic has drawn a very powerful line, overarching line, which is of scare, which is of uncertainty. And, um, and everything else built up under that line might seem trivial and non-significant. So that could be the case. That could happen with gender-based violence also. I mean, the pandemic challenge is so huge that where are you talking about trivial things like gender-based violence? So I see the, also the risk that whatever we have gained over a period of time through different efforts as women's movement also, may got lost in this kind of environment where um, these spaces of expression, both for men and women are shrinking. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Jutta. Um, just in the interest of time, and I did want to get some audience Q&A in. So a question from the audience. Um, role models are obviously very, very important. Who are really role models fighting for men, uh, men's against men's patriarchy in India? Perhaps a question for Harish. So, you know, I mean, there is really a dearth of role models for men. Uh, you know, when I say role model in the sense, not as a professional, but as a person, you know, a man of substance, you know, you have had examples apart from India, you know, sports persons who cry and express their feelings, you know, and they take up a stand, you know, person like Roger Federer, says after he has won or whether he's lost when, you know, to him, you know, he says uh, in one of the last interviews I had seen 
that mm. what his two daughters and wife think about how he's playing that matters to him more important than anyone else so i think you know or you know expression so i find that there's a dearth of people whether it is in sports or cultural field you know there's a dearth of men who would say they would politically correct there are enough number of men who would say that you know uh, I, i violence against women should stop because a woman is somebody's sister somebody's daughter somebody's wife but because she is a human being that you should stand up there's hardly any man who is talking you know from these fields so i find there's a there's a you know there are a lot of people who are politically correct and there are campaigns but there is a woeful dearth of role models but the role models will actually come from lay people so the work which i am doing with young men there are young men who are deconstructing masculinity at the first doing the learning and unlearning and they are in the process redefining and masculinity and creating alternate models you know for themselves for their peers so it's the lay person who are doing you know i find a large number of examples around you know so i think that's the process you know and you know so we were talking i think gary was talking about systemic change so you know one of the subsystems of our society is media so why not work with media and use media so i am for the last 3 years i'm running something called a traveling film fest a film fest will reaches to people and especially young men and they deliberate they talk watching over films and that's a safe space which otherwise they wouldn't get even in their schools or colleges so i find you know so you have to use that medium and through that when people are questioning and sharing their personal anecdotes they talk about it and in a way they are redefining masculinity thanks arish i think that was um, a really powerful note to end the session on um there may not be these big headline role models that the entire nation looks up to right but it's so important to find role models within the local communities and um leverage the power of media both national but also local media through these film fests and whatever that may be um to provide those role models of of a different way of, of being men and boys in today's world so thanks for sharing those thoughts um just in the interest of time i know this is a discussion that uh, we can continue to have for many many more hours uh, but i uh, wanted to 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 bring this to a close and really thank all of our panelists who've joined us today uh, thank you so much gary devyani ravi sujatha and harish for sharing all your thoughts and hopefully the audience started this conversation by thinking that it's going to be a lot more pain than gain um uh, but through all of your advice on how to really engage men and boys through the various institutions the community level making it part of their system and making it easier for them to engage and a holistic solution uh, involving also you know policy but uh, media um all together hopefully provided a lots of advice for our uh, community members here joining us today for how to actually minimize those pains but also maximize gains in um engaging men and boys in this important conversation so thanks everyone and uh I'll say my bye bye thank you david thank you thank you thank you thank you liviani yeah bye 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 good to see you all likewise <laughs> bye